thank you all for tuning in. And I have the joy of introducing Dr. Julie Z, Professor of American Studies at UC Davis and the founding director of the Environmental Justice Project for UC Davis's John Muir Institute for the Environment. Dr. Z's research investigates environmental justice and environmental inequality culture and environment, race, gender, and power, and urban community health and activism. Working in collaboration with environmental scientists, engineers, social scientists, humanists, and community-based organizers in California and New York, she has authored three books, edited a collection, and written countless articles and book chapters on a wide range of topics. Perfect for the same community. Professor Z's first book, Noxious New York, The Racial Politics of Urban Health and Environmental Justice, won the 2008 John Hope Franklin Publication Award, prize, excuse me, awarded annually to the best published book in American studies. Her second book, Fantasy Islands, Chinese Dreams and Ecological Fears in an Age of Climate Crisis, uncovers the stories of sites in China, including the plan for a new eco-city called Dongtain on the island of Chongming, mega suburbs, and the Shanghai World Expo. Exploring the flows, fears, and fantasies of Pacific Rim politics that shape them, she charts how climate change discussions align with US fears of China's ascendancy and the related demise of the American century. And she considers the motives of financial and political capital for eco city and ecological development supported by elite power structures in the UK and China. Her most recent book, titled Environmental Justice in a Moment of Danger, examines mobilizations of movements from protests at Standing Rock to activism in Puerto Rico in the wake of Hurricane Maria, exploring dispossession, deregulation, privatization, and inequality. This book is the essential primer on environmental justice, packed with cautiously hopeful stories for the future, asking what does this moment of danger mean for the environment and for justice? and what can we learn from environmental justice struggles. Dr. Z is an active mentor for first-generation and low-income students in graduate education and deeply committed to public scholarship. Her presentation today will focus on the question of how sustainability students, researchers, and practitioners can move towards a more just world through their praxis. In arguing for a process rather than an object-oriented sustainability, she suggests that we need to move and advance a reflexive politics of knowledge co-production in environmental sciences coupled with a democracy in action. We're so honored to have her here with us today. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Julie Z. Thank you, uh, Fuchsia, um, for that introduction. And thank you, Margaret, um, as well, and Elena for facilitating um, my visit here. I'm very, very excited um, to be here and um, to contribute to this conversation. The the uh, this isn't a talk, um, uh, but it's a conversation um, that's focusing on climate justice and sustainability. Um, thinking about this idea of connections um, and convergence, um, and so what I what I found very interesting in in learning about succinct um, is how succinct um, frames its uh, as a center the the problems you know the problems of um, environmental problems and how this question of how, how do you respond to these environmental problems? So interdisciplinarity is a key component of Sasink's work. And so I want to talk about interdisciplinarity from the standpoint of environmental justice um, in particular, um, because these are conversations and these are um, uh, fields and um, these are conflicts, in sometimes conflicts, that I think are really important to engage and be open and transparent about. And um, these are ongoing um, fields of uh, inquiry and modes of approaching problems that I've been engaged with for a, a very long time. Um, and so again, it's an honor and a privilege to be here and I, I'm looking forward to the Q&A. Um, so the organization, again, this is not a traditional research talk. I'm not doing my book talk. I'm not doing the, the new work on climate justice um, that I'm working on a new book on climate justice as freedom. Um, but what it's more focused on this question of methodology and is drawing heavily from um, this idea of situated sustainabilities. Um, and so I, I, I just wanted to like put that all, you know, on the table that this is not a traditional research talk. I want to start with um, where I'm coming from and why um, where I'm coming from matters as an example of situated environmental justice or situating. Um, then I want to talk about situating sustainability and the framework and what I mean 
um, give a brief example of climate justice and then end with the Q and A. So we'll, we'll see how how this goes. Okay, so you, I think, met, if you're here, you probably saw um, that what I'm going to try to do is describe an environmental justice um, and climate justice that centralizes the worldview of fence line and frontline perspectives. And if you're not familiar with fence line frontline, that's the idea that the people who are most impacted and first impacted um, and and the least responsible um, really take the lead in in addressing climate change. Um, and climate justice um, solutions. Um, and so one of the things I'm very interested in is um, solutions um, language as well. And so what I'm gonna try to do is to talk about the situated sustainability framework, which um, uh, in the edited collection from 2018 um, to, the, to the idea of frontline, fenceline climate justice perspectives um, in order to ask, but obviously not to answer, um, this question of how sustainability students, researchers, and practitioners can move towards a more just world through interdisciplinary praxis. So these are terms that most people kind of think in are, you know, people are very comfortable and, you know, who doesn't support sustainability? Who doesn't support interdisciplinarity? Um, but what I really want to do is to really focus in on this idea of um, race and racism, fence line and front line, um, as we, we move through this question of what sustainability means, what does situating sustainability mean? Um, and specifically, what I'm suggesting is that we really need to be reflexive about what interdisciplinar interdisciplinarity looks like. We need to think really explicitly about the politics of knowledge co-production. Um, alongside and really foregrounding this idea of democracy in action. And so this um, idea of co-production of knowledge and democracy in action are central where there is oftentimes a really uninterrogated un reference to the scientific enterprise um, and solutionist ideology that goes largely unchallenged. And this will make more sense as I sort of move through this. Um, but you know, I want to make it very clear I'm not against solutions at all. Um, but I think that there is a way in which um, there's a technological, um, a turn to techno technology and engineering, especially in the environmental sciences and especially in climate, um, that really doesn't sort of balance out well with the complexity of the, um, both the sources of the problem and the responses to these problems. So I want to make it absolutely clear, I am not anti-science, I'm not anti-technology, I am not against any of these things. But what I think we have to do is be reflexive and understand where we're coming from um, because in part, because I, I am an optimist, I'm a, I'm a, uh, in my book, I talk about non-naive radical hope, you know, and I get engaged deeply in interdisciplinary collaboration. And so part of this um, discussion is for me to model um, for folks who maybe haven't read or thought about what these terms mean from, you know, the, the literature, the scholarship in, in science and technology studies or feminist science studies or environmental justice. Um, that if there, if there isn't a clear understanding of where, what these terms mean and how um, different um, constituencies engage with um, say the language of solutions, um, then it actually leads to more conflict. So again, I'm, I'm offering this not as a critique, but actually as a constructive sort of guide, hopefully. Um, okay, so situating climate justice and sustainability through interdisciplinary place, praxis and social justice and power may enable um, deeper connections and ultimately, I, I would believe and hope and argue, stronger research policy and practice that, need, that moves us towards justice in a rapidly warming world. So, you know, that's what I'm trying to do here. Um, and so let me move to this, where I'm coming from and why it um, matters as an example of situating um, sustainability work or environmental um, work more broadly. So in terms of who I am and my commitment and how I came to this space, I have been working on and with environmental justice movements for I think about 27 years. And this was rooted from the time when I was a student, an, un an undergraduate student that was engaged in environmental them, ethnic studies, activism, um, a lot of the organizing against integration, um, rhetoric um, and politics, um, carceral politics in California and so on. Um, and so that's who I am and that frames my sensibility and how I do the work. So that's just a level of transparency um, about, you know, how I got here and, you know, what my investments are um, in the movements and with the movements. Um, I've also been very uh, 
invested in publicly engaged scholarship. And I use public engagement in a really capacious term. So um, both in the you know, environmental humanities, but also engagement in terms of campus and community collaboration. And some of these are collaborations that have lasted, you know, again, 27 years. I still write with a community partner in New York. I'm developing a new collaboration in, in um, Vallejo, and that's been a 10-year relationship um, and where we're just starting to do the work right now. Um, and I really just want to foreground and in the workshop, we'll talk a little bit more about, you know, the, the mechanics or the, the experiences around that. Um, but what I really want to foreground is, you know, having been so um, focused on community based and environmental justice work that um, we really need to um, enter into these conversations and in relationship with a politics of humility and a, a politics of effort and a politics of sort of shared, um, you know, asking questions, sharing resources and so on. So um, some examples of the interdisciplinary um, sustainability research that I'm involved in currently, but also have been in the past. Currently, I'm a part of the Delta Science Program Science Advisory Committee, um, which is a part of the Delta Stewardship Council. Um, I have been involved in collaborative research efforts um, with uh, environmental scientists, engineers, social scientists, and community members. And I, I remember once um, in a uh, in a group that I worked with Mary Catanasso, who, who Margaret knows, um, that uh, she was saying in her department, uh, she's an urban ecologist, um, who actually does work in Baltimore, um, in her department in plant sciences, interdisciplinary means a plant person working with a STEM person, you know. And so, you know, we were talking about the geography meeting happening right now. And so there are all different kinds of ways that people in different fields use their same terms. So interdisciplinary itself, as much as everybody sort of likes it and it wants it, there's, a, there's different kinds of interdisciplinarity as well. And so um, the interdisciplinarity that, that I have been engaged with, you know, is sort of a radical interdisciplinarity. And I mean radical in both senses of the term. Um, so not just again, a root and the STEM person, but, you know, working across all these fields. Um, and again, um, have been involved in interdisciplinary collaboration on a wide range of issues, including climate change. Um, intellectually, I am come from an ethnic studies, um, humanities, hum humanistic social sciences um, background. And so um, the first, third, and fifth are my sole authored books. The second is the project of, around the environmental justice project um, that I will talk about briefly. Um, and then the, the bulk of the remainder of my time, I will be focused on the fourth one, which is this edited collection that came out in 2018. Um, called Sustainability Approaches to Environmental Justice and Social Power. So my, um, my frameworks are mostly from geography, ethnic studies, um, gender studies, and cultural studies. Um, so the Environmental Justice Project, which again is the second um, image, this is a project um, that I founded uh, which focuses on um, how to develop a research and action agenda around environmental racism and environmental justice in the Central Valley. And so this image is a picture of Teresa de Anda, who was an anti-pesticide drift um, activist um, in uh, early March. And in the early 2000s, um, there uh, was still massive pesticide drift poisonings. So you can see the field on the one hand and her house is right across. Because of the um, nature of the agricultural um, landscape, high value crops, um, uh, uh, the high percentage of pesticides in California um, are, in, especially in the southern San Joaquin, um, are aerial, are aerially um, applied. So, you know, low level crop plains, and then the wind blows, and then, you know, there's a massive poisoning of people. Um, and this is both sort of normalized and, and thought of as just kind of like the cost of doing business. Teresa de Anda was, an, was, she passed actually of a very rare form of cancer, which she and her family attributes to um, her uh, deep exposure to um, these pesticides. And so this was a project that was, um, came out of a master's uh, thesis that I supervised by a woman named Tracy Perkins, who is now a professor at ASU. And she was interested in thinking about, you know, how uh, her question was a, a very narrow question, which was, you know, does this question of politicization and gender and environmental justice, um, is it true in environmental justice? So, you know, to put it very bluntly, you know, if those of you who are familiar with Lois Gibbs or Aaron Brockovich, the idea is that, you know, women and mostly white women are not political, they become exposed to some kind of pollution exposure, and then they become political. So Tracy's question was, is that 
pathway to politicization true when you look at environmental justice activists in the Central Valley. And so she did, you know, 25 interviews, but she was also interested in doing a broader project around this, you know, like not just have the interviews, you know, be in, you know, the thesis that like four people are going to read. And so I, I worked with her um, around uh, doing a public engagement project that is um, images and also uh, an event that happened actually in a few places, both on campus and off campus. The reason why this matters um, is that the context for this work and this kind of research at UC Davis has a particular meaning. UC Davis, for those of you who don't know, is the agricultural um, arm. It was originally called the farm. You know, so it was an output of UC Berkeley to help develop the um, landscape of California into the industrial agricultural powerhouse that it, it remains as such. Um, and you know, so part of why uh, one of the things that I've been really interested in is thinking about kind of the politics of knowledge, knowledge production, and the politics of institutions itself, and, and institutions and also disciplinary fields. And what are the politics embedded in this? So to give you an example of UC Davis, you know, as the, the, the research arm of the, the farm um, the, to transform, you know, the wetlands of California into the um, basically what Carrie McWilliams um, called the factory in the field. You know, we have, at, sit, for me, sitting within UC Davis, a very, very fraught history that is part of the legacy of how you do this work. Um, and so, you know, I was, uh, you know, I'm telling you some of these things in part because you know, there are things that I'm still always learning about my own campus and my own um, politics of knowledge. Um, I'm a professor of American studies and, you know, I knew about the Moral, Moral Act and, you know, uh, uh, which Lincoln passed in um, 1862. And I knew about land grant, universe, uh, land grant universities and the kind of the idea of, you know, public research and for the public good. What I did not know was that the growth of the land grant, grant universities directly comes from um, direct theft or sale of native lands. And this was something I just learned last September as well. So part of what I also try to do always is to kind of talk about these as a continual process myself of reflexive um, understanding of, again, where I sit institutionally and where I sit in terms of the politics of knowledge um, co-production. Um, and so, in, you know, I was quite um, interested and, and kind of horrified to learn that, you know, environmental um, studies at um, UC Davis, um, up until about five years ago, there, you know, thousands, no, not thousands, uh, well, maybe 1,500 majors a year in different kinds of environmental sciences, environmental policy and planning, environmental behavioral um, environment and behavior, never learned about environmental racism, never learned about environmental justice. So again, this again, what is taught and what is, what is allowed to be um, ignored is a politics of knowledge um, co-production itself. Ignorance itself is produced, in other words. So this question of institutions and praxis is something that I've been very interested in um, for a long time. And you know, I encourage you to go look at the Voices from the Valley website. It's a good teaching tool for anybody who wants to kind of teach this material. Um, and it was not a sort of a high cost you know, project. I think we got maybe $10,000 in different kinds of um, community public engagement grants, but it was kind of a high value um, project in the sense of, um, doing this kind of collaborative, co-produced work. And so the fundamental idea, I think, in environmental justice um, movements that this project embodied is this idea of the people who are most impacted tell their stories. And they're, the people most impacted, and this is from the environmental justice idea of, you know, people, the environment is where we live, work, and play. Those stories ground the work. Those stories guide it. Um, they're not add-ons. They're not, they're not um, things they they actually have to be centered in that. Um, and I also, there's another website um, that, uh, specifically about Teresa de Anda, which has um, many of her um, interviews and so on, and kind of remembering again, these stories of activism that don't get talked about very much. Um, briefly, um, Environmental Justice in a Moment of Danger is my, in my most recent book. Um, and the royalties to that book go to Community Water Center in Visalia which is a group that does really important water justice work and a community partner of mine um, in New York that I've worked with for over 27 years. 
So this book um, very simply talks about this idea, this question of what crossroads and moment are we in now, and what might we learn from environmental justice movements in our moment of danger. Um, the the argument for that book is pretty simple. I'm, I'm not, I can't talk about it, but basically that justice, environmental justice, is part of a freedom movement. That's basically it. <laughs> But you know, I'm happy to talk about that more. But what I really want to turn to right now is this idea of situating sustainability. So hopefully, I gave you some sense of what that means in a in a very little project, you know, which had high impact in terms of um, the conflict and the suspicion that community members had. You know, as I came from an environmental justice movement in New York, and you know, came into the Central Valley context where people were like, hmm. You know, it didn't matter that I had credibility as a movement person coming from New York. You can't just translate your relationships. You have to rebuild them and attend to them over time. And so that idea of connections is a really important one. So I want to talk about sustainability and situating sustainability in particular through this idea of connections, confounding and convergence. For those of you in the more like science world, um, you are, rec you know, either this idea of convergence science and research is something you're already familiar with. So going back to the succinct um, I, uh, website about, you know, this idea of there's problems and then there's how, how do we get to solve those problems? And so what I want us to think about always as we, as we do our work, however you do your work, is to think about what kind of questions are being asked. And again, to be reflexive and um, self-aware about um, the ideologies embedded in them. And so again, to, to say that there is such a thing as solutionist ideology is not to be anti-solutionist, an, but to say that the automatic turn to um, empirical documentation or technocratic or policy fixes is not enough. I mean, and climate change is a perfect example of that. There's, very, there's a lot of science right now that already documents the, the reality of this. And yet there is not as much movement as needs to be given the scale and scope of the problems. So again, I think we need to be very um, cognizant of um, this question of how questions um, are being approached and who, as opposed to just our default ways that we engage with, with these, these big problems, the biggest problems that we are all facing. So we need radical, um, in both senses of the term, interdisciplinarity. Um, and so in the edited collection, um, the framing questions for that are what does sustainability mean? And again, sustainability is one of those words that everybody likes. Nobody's against sustainability. However, we have to think more carefully about how sustainability functions in multiple dimensions, including material, pragmatic, ideological, and discursive dimensions. What are the concept, context for how sustainability is conceptualized, enacted, and contested? This, a core question of what is meant by sustainability. Who, who is it sustainable for? Why and how? Where and how do social justice and sustainability connect and how is that connection achieved? So, um, so this question, I can't see because the, the bar is covering it. I cannot even see the title of this right now, but there's some kind of question of sustainability. Um, so the point is that there's a foregrounding in the edited collection of power and justice. And so sustainability is not just an object, a problem to be solved, but that we have to really foreground this question of subjectivity and co-production in there. We can't get to sustainability unless we foreground um, radical interdisciplinarity, um, connections with, um, in, in the broadest sense, connections between disciplines, connections between campus and community, connections between um, histories and presence as well. Um, so sustainability, um, the, the scholars um, from the humanities to the environmental sciences have been asking this question already. And I shared with the um, scholars, um, which we'll talk about, um, uh, Mary Cananasso and Stuart Pickett asked why a shared vision of sustainability is so elusive given that it is so widely invoked. So there are antecedents to this idea of si situated sustainabilities um, around uh, just sustainability and critical sustainability. So the idea um, that uh, Eigenman Bullard and Evans asked in 2003 was basically arguing that there cannot be sustainability without justice. So this is an old idea, but it's worth, um, it's important for us to keep on having. Um, so the situated sustainabilities framework um, really takes on I, this question of how, how do we move towards sustainability? And what the volume overall argues is that we need to foreground interdisciplinarity. And by interdisciplinarity, it's, we really are explicit um, that we have to foreground the politics of praxis um, and be aware of these questions of positionality. 
So within and without institutions um, are questions of positionality, identity, um, questions of class, questions of gender and race, um, and that those questions of positionality have to be centered um, if, if we're gonna do praxis in a way that doesn't sort of recreate um, the problems of the past. Um, interdisciplinarity has to engage sustainability science um, in a way that is deeply reflexive. Um, it also has to engage across the environmental humanities um, and post-colonial and decolonial histories um, and the afterlife of um, enslavement and, and um, uh, anti-blackness. Um, so the idea of situating sustainabilities in the introduction we um, did, and it's a co-written introduction with um, 10 other scholars across um, the fields. Um, we talked about uh, the idea of situating sustainabilities and the intellectual history of that idea um, coming from the uh, original research, uh, original language around sustainable, sustainable development. Um, again, just sustainability and environmental justice research as being antecedents to this idea of situating sustainabilities. Um, that it, situating sustain, sustainability is indebted to the environmental humanities and to developing cross-sector knowledge co-production and knowledge makers. And there has to be a centralization of issues of race, gender, um, sexuality, indigeneity, and, and may, but not in always, um, gesture towards anti-capitalism. Or, you know, if you don't want to get to anti-capitalism, at least politics more, more explicitly. Um, so this question of what is positionality, power, and perspective is really structured around this question of how does sustainability avoid the trap of reinforcing dominant ideologies that produce social injustice and environmental harm. Um, in other words, the, um, the idea of situating sustainability, it, it, for those of you who are, are science and technology studies scholars or feminist science studies, you will you know, understand that situating sustainability comes from you know, situating um, feminism, situating geography, you know, this is, this is not um, a, a, a framework that comes out of nowhere. Um, for, for us in the collection and for me in particular, um, being grounded in environmental justice movements over at, at close to three decades, the framing, environmental justice really frames situated sustainabilities. Um, and the environmental justice movement has done a very, very good job of foregrounding its values and its vision. So for those of you who are probably familiar with the principles of environmental justice, the Bali principles of climate justice, um, the indigenous principles of just transition, which just were um, produced last year. And I think maybe the most important is the Hamas principles for democratic organizing. So I would encourage you, if you're not familiar with these kind of statements of vision and values to take a look at them. Um, again, you know, because I come out of the, those movements, that's how I frame how I view this work. Um, so I wanted to think um, about convergence through situated sustainabilities. Um, and that situated sustainabilities is also about convergence. Um, and so uh, it may be clear to you from the, uh, some of you are, are from the environmental humanities, not many of you, but I saw one or two, um, that actually I come from a humanistic background originally and sort of ended up in environmental justice work. So for me, language um, and discourse is actually really important because it actually sets the parameters of what kinds of questions get asked and how interpretations are made. And so for me, when I see, you know, there's a term that is used this way, it's like the example I was giving you before about um, the collaborative interdisciplinary research. We sp literally spent in, um, nine months, this group of four scholars, um, trying to understand what our different fields meant by scale. You know, that's how deep the, the level of learning and humility needs to be. You know, and because we had a framework where we weren't defensive, we we're like, wait, what does scale mean for you? What does scale mean for you? you know, we actually got to a better place and uh, you know, ultimately um, uh, 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 some better work, I think, um, from that. And so you know, that's very antithetical, the politics of sort of time and trust you know, to the institution um, that we're in, which is about you know, production, publishing, you know, blah, 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 blah. But environmental justice is on a different kind of time scale. There are different time scales that are operating simultaneously. And I think that that is something that is both challenging, but it's also can be very powerful as well. So when I talk about convergence, or when we talk about convergence in the introduction, we're talking about convergence between academic fields, between research and praxis, um, practice, and between campus and community. So let me give you just one quick example, and then we'll, I'll, I want to turn to the Q&A. 
So the Climate Justice Alliance um, is based is a you know very interesting um, alliance of alliances that are um, working right now around climate justice. So climate justice, like sustainability, like resilience, like ecosystem services, is one of those terms that is now becoming common sense. And um, if if you've read some of my other work, you know. I'm sure most of you have it, but you know, I'm a Gramscian. And so the production of the common sense is actually very interesting and important to me. And so climate justice, like sustainability, um, like resilience, is one of those terms that is becoming more and more used. Who is against climate justice? Who in their right mind could be against climate justice? But why I think what's really important is um, how the climate justice movement really comes directly out of the environmental justice movement. So the Bali principles for environment of climate justice really come, there's the same organizations are involved and they're heavily networked um, nationally and internationally around a justice framework. So I really want us to think, especially as we see climate justice um, being talked about more and more, to think about whether or how frontline and fence line perspectives are um, foregrounded. So, um, I, environmental justice um, and climate change. Um, I talk about this in the third chapter of my book, um, which talks about this production of non-naive radical hope and this idea of, um, you know, I mean, we don't have really time. Most of you already know this. There's deep inequalities around climate. Um, you know, the, the, the geographic areas that are most impacted and the poor people of the world who are least responsible um, are the first impacted, you know, whether that's island nations in the Pacific, in um, Alaska, in the Caribbean, um, to sea level rise. Um, and so while this is a global problem, it, it, it distributes unequally and is magnified um, by, again, these histories of um, colonialism and the, on, on, the ongoing legacies of modernity, one could argue. So again, you know, the, on the bottom, you could see this picture of Hurricane Katrina uh, in 2005 and, you know, the policing, uh, you know, of the majority black um, population in the, in the Superdome and then relocate Kivalina. So I talk about these two as examples of um, the climate justice uh, movement, both in terms of um, framing the problems, but also the responses to it. Um, and Kivalina is one of four, 400 um, Arctic indigenous um, communities that are currently being washed away um, by sea level rise. Kivalina is not unique, but it is special in the sense that they actually sued um, the oil and gas companies for the harm that was happening because of their work. Um, the lawsuit got thrown out in, in the Ninth Circuit, um, in part because the court found that this was a political problem, not a legal one. So these distinctions, again, between political, legal, social, environmental, um, health, and, um, and uh, health and body, these are distinctions that are not meaningful for environmental justice activists and for, I think, most people in the world. But it is a, it is a construction um, and institutionalized through knowledge, through um, agencies, through um, majors, you know, at the, the university, et cetera. And so what I find really um, interesting about thinking about climate change over time um, is how this idea of, um, her, you know, the, the horrors of um, climate uh, racism and the impacts of um, increased hurricanes, you know, this was something that the Environmental Justice and Climate Change Coalition was already aware of in 1997. So I remember when I was a young organizer, there was a fact sheet that talked about what the impacts of a major hurricane would be in New Orleans. And again, Hurricane Katrina happened in 2005. There was this fact sheet in 1997. And I was 23 at the time. And I remember looking at it and going, that can't happen. You know, that's not possible. And in fact, exactly what they, you know, I was looking at it like a sort of dystopian novel, you know. And of course, that's what exactly what happened. And now we are familiar with the, um, the, the kinds of disasters and the, you know, how people, um, people of color and poor people and disabled people are more, made more vulnerable through these problems, which they are less responsible for. So for me, that's why I always return to the environmental justice movement and this idea that their perspective actually needs to center the responses because we ignore the justice movement at their own peril. Um, and so thinking, going back to the Climate Justice Alliance, um, I, I really think, you know, if you have, are not familiar with the group, you should check it out. Their idea of just transition um, is very um, 
fascinating and it's a very capacious idea. Um, and so if you think of justice, uh, of just transition in primarily a technological or policy narrow perspective, you know, you will not see this kind of range of um, perspectives, including, you know, this idea of Buen Vivir, which comes out of Latin America and degrowth movements, the idea of culture and tradition, solidarity and so on. So this, this, this politics of defining, um, claiming, you know, this really comes out um, in the climate justice movement. And Just Transition was first named actually by environmental justice movements in 1997, which was trying to make alliances between oil union workers and environmentalists to kind of get out of the trap of labor and environment, you know, to say that there is actually a future where labor and environmentalism converge. Um, and so uh, this question again of whose voices and perspectives matter are necessarily epistemological and political. Um, again, back to the Climate Justice Alliance, on the left, you see this idea of, you know, again, what the problem is and the, what the, where we want to get to, the, the environmental justice and climate justice movement. And so on the left, you see extractive economy, and, and many of us are familiar with, you know, extraction, the politics of dig, burn, and dump. Um, but what we don't normally see in sort of uh, mainstream accounts of just transition is a critique of consumerism and colonialism, a critique of militarism and enclosure of wealth and power. And so then you see on the right, this idea of regeneration, deep democracy, well-being, caring, and sacredness. Um, and so the politics, um, and this is very, you know, very much um, a values filter they talk about um, in the bottom. And so you know, this also is a visualization um, of a, fun, a fence line, front line perspective. And I think you can even see this um, in this recent piece about uh, thinking about carbon, carbon dioxide removal and just climate policy. And so for those of, so those of us or those of you who you know, work more on these, um, in these areas, you know, just thinking about what it means to work in an interdisciplinary way. And what I find really fascinating about this article is that um, the authors and where they're coming from, including you know, one of my favorite um, people that I'm, I'm spending a lot of time reading right now, a philosopher at Georgetown um, named Olufemi, um, Taiwo, who talks about the moment we're in being one where we can think about climate apartheid or climate reparations, you know. And so thinking about, you know, these kinds of questions um, from your particular lens, I think is a really powerful one. Um, so I want to leave a ton of time for questions. So I sort of blew through a lot. I, you know, this is kind of, you know, me on sleep deprivation and, you know, my uh, my approach to teaching which is you know like let's throw out a bunch of things and see what people want to talk about and so my ending thoughts are that framing leads to different pathways for action and research old paradigms of research and knowledge production don't work in relation to climate change and so this idea that we can just go back to our old modes our old ways of doing things our old assumptions um do not make sense and i think you know you could see a lot of these um uh, um discussions or perspectives um, in the just transition, um, but also, you know, in a moment of COVID as well. And so you could see a lot of this idea of just recovery, you know, um, and so the idea that, you know, we were not trying to get back to normal because normal didn't work for lots of people and lots of communities that were already sort of produced, um, produced early death or this idea of kind of normalized, you know, certain communities have worse or are primed to die. You know, that's not an acceptable perspective from a justice perspective. Um, and so this idea of democracy in action can connect diverse struggles and movements. And in the, my most recent book, I talk about how um, struggles at Standing Rock are linked to struggles at Flint, in Flint, how they're linked to um, struggles in the Central Valley by people like Teresa de Anda. Um, because those movements and those activists are already making those connections. Frames shape the larger source of these problems. And so this idea of naming what a problem is creates different conversations about what those outcomes or solutions might be. And those different outcomes might not be, and probably the justice movements would argue, should not be market-based, top-down, or technocratic, given that that's the exi existing structure that created harms differentially in the first place. So I think I will end there and, and give us a lot of time for, for Q&A. So uh, I'll turn it over to to help me facilitate that. Thank you. Great. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I know uh, it's, I wish there was like the reaction button <laughs> so everyone could do the little clapping hands. Um, 
But yeah, so, so that was an excellent presentation. And we have about 15 minutes left for Q and A. Um, you know, I think the the point that you ended on, and um, throughout throughout your talk, you know, you talked about kind of the the translatability of of relational values, right? And going from New York to um, to California and having to build new relationships. But you also really mentioned the the connections that exist between these different movements, both oh through space and time. And so one of the one of the questions that we have in the chat um, is is from Rachel Mason and she asks, um, you know, how if you, if you could talk a little bit more about how you built those those relationships through those transitions and and what that process was like. Um, and I think maybe, you know, particularly given your your background in activism as well, if if that's the, the point of connection that you're able to make um, in terms of that that kind of line of solidarity or, or just you know general thoughts on, on that process. Yeah, I, I think that for me, um, because I came of age, you know, I, I developed intellectually and personally inside environmental justice movements, I know of no other way to be, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and so, you know, for for me that, um, and, and it's interesting, especially because, you know, you think about like how much time and work um, goes into kind of caring and nurturing, you know, those relationships and including being transparent about when they don't do well, you know, and, you know, the, the, I'm actually most proud of the fact that, you know, I'm building this relationship in Vallejo and part of the conflict, um, actually the, the community partner um, I have, um, uh, she had a real problem with one of my collaborators. Do you know what I mean? And so we had to repair that relationship and it's taken about 10 years so that we could even get to that place again. Do you know what I mean? And so there's a lot of um, deep time that has to um, go into that. Do you know what I mean? And so um, the, the, the Hamez principles are very valuable because they talk about extraction also in terms of relationships as well. And the extraction that goes um, along with kind of um, knowledge producers or you know people from the academy and communities, and so that's why the co-production model has to be centered. Do you know what I mean? And so, and that's a different ethics. That's a different position. That's different. Um, that means sharing resources. It means sharing, uh, and I, that's what I mean very materially resources. You know, like literally, you know, half. You know what I mean? or more than half to the community, um, sharing credit, sharing, you know, all kinds of things. Do you know what I mean? Um, and that, uh, and, and including, like, you have to be, like, you know, community leads first. I mean, that's where I'm coming from. I don't know, you know, that's, that's the only way it makes sense for me. You can't do environmental justice work for me, if, um, to me, unless you do that, unless you do the ethics of, of that work. Um, I mean, I guess it's sort of similar to the conversations within abolition, right? Like, a, and about how you you want to live the values, you know, that you want to be in the world. Do you know what I mean? And so that value has, if you believe in feminist values, if you believe in a politics against extraction, how does that actually look like? Do you know what I mean? It might mean doing something differently than than what you've been trained to do. Or hopefully, you know, I do believe I'm an optimist. Do you know what I mean? I, I was giving you this example of what UC Davis looked like five years ago. And, you know, now there is a faculty person that does environmental justice within environmental policy. For a while, there were scholars who were doing this work, and but we were all tangential, right? Like it was Jonathan London in community development, or, you know, me in American studies, or Beth Rose Middleton and Liza Grandia in Native American studies. We were not training and teaching, you know, to the people who are graduating with environmental degrees from UC Davis. And yet we were producing as an institution, hundreds of people who were going out to become, you know, work in state agencies or work in environmental groups with no knowledge or background of environmental justice. That's just unethical in my perspective. So the students themselves, you know, started to push because they were also a more under, you know, A, the demographics of the students were changing. More students were first gen coming from communities that were directly impacted, you know, um, but also, understanding that you know this world is going on that's why you know for me i i often talk about my own experiences because 
you know, in 1996, environmental justice research was like, is there a disparity? You know, that was the state of the work. And we needed that level of empirical documentation. It's the same thing in the health disparities research field. You know, you needed the empirical documentation. And now, 25 years later, we have enough empirical documentation. Mm -hmm. So now it's a different set of questions and concerns, right? So why would you use the same models of just empirically documenting? Do you know what I mean? That, that's not enough. Not for the moment that we're facing right now. Not because of the urgency of what we're looking the barrel, you know, down um, and so on. So I hope that that makes sense. Um, so, you know, I think in some ways doing environmental justice, like more people understand what's at stake. I mean, the, you know, I, I talk a lot in the, in the book, the most recent book about non-naive radical hope, you know what I mean? And so, you know, I, I believe I'm still hopeful, but I'm also critical. Um, and this, but we also have to accept when things are, when things do move, it's not the same, you know, there's a changing um, you know, this idea of like the changing same too, you know, and so, but we have to also be optimistic too, you know, but not, not delusional. You know what I mean, and this is the not, this is the non-naive part. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So more people well, get it, but you know. So that, that ties in nicely um, to, to one of the next questions that we have from Dana Graf, who um, is our, our research and action fellow at Sustink, and she she asks, you know, do you see connections between the the radicality of the interdisciplinary that you talk about and that of non naive hope, and what are those linkages between the two? Yeah, I mean, I think that especially on climate, you know, um, I have been doing a lot of, um, work around um, uh, the about. Um, different affective registers around climate um, and climate action. Um, I think a lot, there's a lot of scholarship around climate grief and sort of climate nihilism and, you know, people, uh, you know, and then on the other hand, if you look in within climate justice movements, there's a, also a vibrancy of culture and um, humor and satire, which, you know, if, if you're not within an environmental justice uh, standpoint, seems odd. Like, you know, just recently there was this um, uh, film that, premiered at the DC Environmental Film Festival called Ain't Your, Ain't Your Mama's Heat Wave. And it was actually a co-production model um, that was for African-American um, comics talking about climate change and climate justice in Norfolk, Virginia, which, you know, is being directly impacted by, um, by sea level rise and being so, you know, the poor and mostly African-American parts of Norfolk are being washed away. And so, you know, this idea again of, um, the, it's an incredible, there's an incredible report that goes along with this, um, this uh, comedy show, you know what I mean? But it's not alone, you know, there's people like Dallas Goldtooth, who's an indigenous com um, comic, but also lead organizer with the Keep It in the Ground campaign. He's the son of um, uh, Tom Goldtooth, who's the founder of the Indigenous Environmental Network. So Dallas is in a, um, a, a part of an all indigenous um, comedy group called the 1491s. You know, so if you look at climate justice and youth movements, and there's a lot of humor, satire in hip hop, artwork, and so on. And so, you know, I think that the idea of how um, you have um, hope is really shaped by your historical perspective and your idea of like the newness of these problems. You know, and so I think that there's a lot of convergence um, between thinking about, you know, COVID and climate change and kind of normalizing baseline and also the horror, you know, for some people who have been able to imagine that their lives were not directly impacted by X, Y, or Z. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I'm in California, you know, there's no escape from wildfires, you know, and race and class privilege doesn't get you very much. Do you know what I mean? Your skies are still... You know what I mean? And so that idea of danger and disaster and the kind of the end of the world, you know, for Black and Indigenous people, that has been a reality for a very long time. And there's been a sort of cultural um, responses, you know, around survival. So Dallas Goldtooth will say, you know, we have to laugh because we have to laugh through the tears because that's how we process, you know, the weight of what we're doing. And the, and the, he says in this interview, the batshit craziness of the, of the, of the work. You know, and so um, hopefully I forgot what the question was, but you know, hopefully that answered some some yeah, of it. Yeah, I think um, you know, I think I think you you've answered. Well, Dana, you could let us know if you have a follow up question. Um, although we are we are running um, short on time, but you know, I think you 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 brought up some really good points, right? Talking about um, not just positionality from earlier in in your presentation, but thinking about.
the the way that we sit, um, particularly, I think, in, in academic um, land grant universities or just research universities overall, and thinking about um, what that means to be using a, a lens or frame framings of environmental justice and pushing for that um, you know, radical interdisciplinary while being housed in, in these spaces that are very colonialist in nature. And so um, we have uh, an anonymous question that um, is, is specific to early career research scholars. And, and they ask what advice you have for those who are in their early career and trying to work in these issues and stay in the academy to do so um, but, but struggling when it seems like, you know, the academy or, or departments, um, particularly when it comes to hiring, are, are stuck in these kind of old models of, of privileging certain ways of knowing. And if, if there are, you know, advice pathways forward that you see, um, given, given your long history of, of activism and also doing that while rooted in the academy. Yeah, that's a great um, question. Um, I think that, um, Again, you know, how do I have um, hope? You know, I have hope based on what, what students do, you know, um, and students, I mean, both undergraduate and graduate students and postdoctoral scholars, like that's where I feel like I can retain some optimism. And I do think, you know, there's a moment um, of opportunity now where there is a greater recognition. It's kind of um, because of the, the police um, killings and the response, you know, um, and, you know, with George Floyd um, and, you know, the, that at least, and this again, you know, I'm speaking from California, which, you know, I hope I, I'm not, um, a lot of people think California is this wonderful progressive place, but when I was a student activist, you know, we, we pioneered, literally, I'm saying pioneered, you know, three strikes are out, anti-affirmative action, anti-immigration, and so on. Um, and so, um, so please don't think California is like this liberal place that's very, you know, wonderful or whatever. But, you know, within my own institution, which, you know, is very um, science dominant, and which really kind of downplays, you know, the other fields, there is a shift in some departments, and in some fields, to taking these questions more seriously um, and to, um, to think about, you know, the politics of who gets hired, what's taught, you know, in part because, you know, the, you can't kind of live in a sort of bubble, you know what I mean, around it. So, you know, departments on my campus that I'm literally shocked, you know, are starting to have anti-racism, you know, committees and to think about what it means to do diversity um, work and transformational work within their where where they sit, and of course it's not it's they're very it's very deeply contested. Do you know what I mean? And so like you know it's it's not like it's hegemonic. Do you know what I mean? It's not like seventy thirty. It's like fifty one forty nine. Do you know what I mean? Um, to put it you know, but but fifty one is like better than it was a few years ago when it was like I would say thirty seven. You know to to sixty three. Do you know what I mean? And so you know I think it's, we just have to believe, and this is the quote that I use, you know, in the, in the most recent book of the, and it's borrowed from a sociologist named Daniel Aldana Cohen, where he talks about like, you know, we have to, you know, just keep on doing the work. And sometimes there's a surge forward. And that's idea of like, you know, we can think of surging seas as like a, you know, hor horrible and sea level rise, but, you know, movements also surge, do you know what I mean? And there's this moment, and this is why this idea of a moment of danger and a moment of crisis is so important. Um, and so, you know, this, that we are in a moment where there's a lot of stuff that's being deeply contested. And so, you know, yes, some fields are more um, hostile than others and more, and it's department specific and, you know, all those things. And yet there's things that are also shifting around us. So we have to, things that look like they are un immovable, sometimes move quite, quite radically. Do you know what I mean? And so if you just keep on doing the work, you know, that, then that's, that might happen. And so that's, that's how, that's how I feel about that. I, I'm trying to be like, again, a non-naive person about this. No, <laughs> no I appreciate it. Um, yeah. And I think, I, uh, you know, per, perhaps that's, that's a good place to, to close, right? Um, is is to, to keep doing the work and, and trust that the work is good um, and that, and that change will come of that work. Um, and so we, we are at three, 3.59 um, Eastern Standard Time. And 
I, I want to make sure that um, doctors, you have the, the break before we transition um, over to the workshop. So I apologize. I know there were a couple additional questions that we weren't able to get to, um, but we will, we will save the questions and share those with you, Dr. Z. Um, and again, I, I just want to thank you all for coming. Um, thank you so much for, for this great dialogue and conversation. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate um, the chance to chat with you.